Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. This is uh, Sex and Suicide's Women Crush Wednesday. And I have a beautiful young woman in front of me named Monica Chun. Mm -hmm. And Monica, tell me a little bit about yourself because we were hooked up together through a mutual friend, Marlon mm -hmm. Brown. And Marlon's been on the podcast and shared his story earlier. So mm -hmm. shout out to Marlon. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> Uh, Marlon was actually going to co-host tonight, but he decided uh, he, he'd rather make some money, and he, that, he totally understand that. He's personal training right now, so thanks for, uh, for putting us in touch, and I know you're listening, buddy, so thank you for that and all the support. So, Monica, tell me about you. You're a, a student at UWO here in London, Ontario, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. I am uh, just finished my third year, going into my fourth year, um, but not my final year. I'm taking no. a fifth year. Okay. For sure. And what are you taking? I'm taking psychology and health science right now. I just switched into health science from, so um, not sociology, uh, criminology. Criminology. Yes. Okay, good for you. Yeah. So what drew you towards psychology, just out of curiosity? Um, I just love understanding the mind, just yeah. the way that people think. And like just struggling with mental health is just like... <laughs> I want to understand why people feel this way. Right. Um, so, yeah. Do you think that's a common thing, just out of curiosity? Because um, my father's a physician. He's actually mm -hmm. a surgeon. And I talked to him about some of the people that were drawn towards psychology and psychiatry. Mm -hmm. And he said they were some of the ones that were the furthest out there, like the wackiest really? bunch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering, do you think that people that are kind of drawn towards mental health might actually be experiencing some mental health issues themselves? Do you think that there's any correlation there? I think there is because um, you just dealing with mental health myself i want to understand myself More. why do i feel this way like just get right. to the root of the issue right yeah so and yeah. do you does that do you find that you want to help other people in that regard too? 100 percent right 100 percent. so yes. what are your goals long term when you graduate from western um i hope to eventually be an occupational therapist actually um hopefully with some sort of I don't know, elderly people I love to work with. Um, right. I currently volunteer at a senior home uh, with people with Alzheimer's, actually. Oh, wow. Good for yeah. you. They're the sweetest people ever. And you just have to have just the most, the utmost patience with them because, like, you know, you talk to them and then leave for two minutes and then you'll come back and they'll ask the same questions or say the same things. Right. And, like, you just have to have the patience. Sure. I feel like I feel like I might be getting Alzheimer's already <laughs> because I feel like that's what I do right now. I feel like I have a tough time remembering what I eat for breakfast and what story I told you, at least lately anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so you're here this evening and we appreciate you coming. Mm -hmm. um, how do you know Marlon? Um, Tell me I, that story. I met him through um, Spur Fashion Show. We did um, just a little launch video together. Um, yeah. And after that, it was just kind of like, small talk i kind of saw him i um actually trained with a friend of his yep. um alan Wu, mm -hmm. and um marlon would always be at the same gym um they trained at the same gym so right. um just kind of started talking to marlon every now and then um when i saw him at the gym <laughs> how was the switch was there any bad blood for um, these trainers? <laughs> well like um alan he's from vancouver so okay. he's not here working so i, I just i still wanted to train and so marlon's here and so right on you know and, and as I was telling you, I said, Marlon always mm. gets these beautiful young women <laughs> and he's training all of them. It just, it's ama it amazes me. Mm. He always finds uh, some fascinating people for mm. me that have incredible stories. So mm. I owe him a, a, he's, you know, I'm in his debt, yeah. so to speak. Um, so why don't you tell me a little bit about your experience at Western? Um, <clears throat> well, honestly, I haven't really done much uh, my first three years. Um, in my third year, that's when I started to take on um, Spur Fashion Show. Um, okay. Like, first and second year is just, like, no studying. That's it. I didn't really have an interest in extracurriculars just because I was, like, social. I had social anxiety. So, I okay. was just drawn away from, like, the, any sort of social thing. Okay. Right? And so, um, third year, I decided to join Spur Fashion Show. And that was the best decision I've ever made because I met such amazing people just supportive people who support me and my mental health through what right through whatever i'm going through they are supportive right so you've mentioned mental health a few times mm -hmm. and social anxiety and and mm -hmm. i myself have dealt with anxiety as well social anxiety too mm -hmm. um when did when did you start having these mental health struggles so to speak or when did you recognize it as such um so it's been a long battle with mental health um I can probably go back to when I was actually four. Really? Yes. Wow. Um, so when I was four, I was um, I was selectively mute. So basically, that means I didn't 
I only talked to a select number of people. Like I would talk to my family. I had um, you know a few friends at school, and those were the only people I talked to. I really? would not talk to uh, any adults or any other kids in my class that I didn't know. And wow. I was I actually had like a fear of adults at the time. Um, like they just scared the shit out of me. I don't really? know why. Yeah, big and people. Yeah, yeah and sure. um, this went on until I was about eight. So four years of of this and throughout this I um, actually had teachers who yelled at me because I wouldn't talk right really? and that just kind of um, made, made it worse, worse. yeah right because sure. I just became more and more scared of them right, right. Mm. you didn't want to get yelled at yeah would? exactly and so it wasn't until um, I was eight where I had just the sweetest teacher and that just kind of changed the way I thought about adults because she was just so nice right right and so I actually asked a question and you know some students had their hands up and I raised my hands up and all the kids around me they're like <laughs> it was an what? event <laughs> this yeah. bitch doesn't know how to talk like what, you, what is her hand up you know <laughs> um and so my teacher saw me and um hmm. she chose me to answer the question and and I answered it and all the kids were like everyone's jaw just <laughs> dropped and you can hear like gasps in the like gasps in the back of the room right, right? and everyone's staring at me I was like what how, how, how did you feel at that time I was just honestly terrified it was terrifying and good at once because right. like I had finally overcome this this selective mutism right but also like everyone was staring at me I was like I was terrified and so I sure. just looked at my teacher and she just had the biggest smile on her face uh. and she just continued teaching like she didn't just create a fucking mir- miracle <laughs> right? right so Wow, yeah. that is crazy because yeah. I don't remember fuck all about grade three. <laughs> like I don't, I don't think I remember fuck all about public school really. <laughs> so good for you. You remember when you were four and it started? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's wild. So, mm-hmm. is would you say that like around eight years old is when you started talking to other people or? Um, yeah, I started talking. Um, like whenever adults would talk to me, I, I would. You talk would still to them. respond. Yeah. So, so before that, were you just giving them like a blank stare and people thought Honestly, you were just yeah. a blank? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what the fuck's wrong with this kid? <laughs> Wow, yeah. I've I've only seen that. I've never seen that in real life before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. never. So it's a thing. It's a thing. Because I've seen it in a movie, and I can't remember mm-hmm. what movie it was. It had like Martin Short in it, mm-hmm. and uh, anyway, <laughs> sidetracking. <laughs> but she had it. She had been through in that movie. She had been through an experience. I think she lost her mom or her dad, mm-hmm. and she just kind of shut down. Did anything? Mm-hmm. Did anything happen to you beforehand that led to that? Or I don't quite remember, but I like I don't know why I was just so terrified of adults. It right. Was, I was. So you I'm don't know sure. if something happened previously to make you start fearing them. It was, I mean, obviously you're doing a great job. You're already <laughs> remembering it four fucking years old. <laughs> I don't remember shit at that age. So good for you. Um, you. So would you say that that was like, is that where the anxiety started or would you say that's sort of a separate mental health thing? I think that's definitely where, where my the anxiety, anxiety started. began. Yeah. Okay. 100%. And then what happened around the, like as soon as you started, you were able to talk to people. Mm-hmm. Then, then, sort of, where does your story go from there? Um, so it was fine until um, I was about twelve. Um, like my anxiety was was fine. Like it, I didn't, I wasn't anxious around like talking, being social, and um, like being social. Right. Um, in grade seven was when I started having just really bad self esteem issues. Okay. Um, I remember just um, like I stopped eating because I thought I was fat, even though like I was not fat ever. Right. I was. I, I believe looked, that. I, <laughs> yeah. I looked like a twig my entire life, except when I was a baby. I was a fat baby. But otherwise, We're like I've been, <laughs> I was like, like a stick. I was right. so skinny and I thought I was fat. And um, like I stopped eating lunch. I started, I stopped um, bringing lunches to school. I in grade seven. In grade seven. Um. And outside of school, I just tracked every single calorie that went into my body. Wow. And I just, I refused to eat more than a thousand calories a day. Wow. Yeah. Are, are At you, 12. Are you okay? Is this bringing you back to that time yeah. a little bit? That's okay. Take your time. Take your time, my dear. So, so did you develop then, was it an eating disorder at, at that age that you um, developed or what would you classify that as? I wouldn't say... An eating disorder per se. I think an eating disorder would be like a lot more serious, but like, like right. I mean, a thousand calories a day. That's still serious. And yeah, stuff. absolutely. Yeah, but I. What made you pick a thousand calories a day? Why a thousand? I don't know. It's just like, 
I just wanted to stop consuming so much. What I thought at the time was a lot. Right. Um, yeah. Oh, you poor I'm thing. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Take your time. Uh, okay. 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 Um. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> That's okay. And for everyone that, that could be watching, this is Monica's first time sort of going through her story from start to finish. So thank you very much for sharing it with mm-hmm. us. Feel free to take your time. Everyone has sympathy and empathy and compassion that watches these things. So don't worry. We're, uh, it's just you and me here. Okay. 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 Awesome. So it wasn't until um, I think grade eight where I realized that I had to stop. Um, it was because um, like a student told my teacher, my grade eight teacher, that I wasn't eating lunch. Okay. And this the student wasn't like concerned they just he just wanted to be an asshole and he like snitch on me yeah on pretty much and so my, my kids teacher, are fuckers <laughs> at that age eh? i'm sure i was yeah. too but <laughs> and so my teacher was just horrified with me she's like why are you not eating you're so skinny already like why and so right like i remember she actually bought me lunch that day when yeah. when she found out and she just kept an eye on me ever since like throughout the rest of the year she just made sure that i ate really yeah so how did yeah. that make you feel? I mean, were you pissed off that someone was kind of force feeding you or did you kind um, of loosen up on the, the thousand calorie rule? Um, I definitely knew what I was doing was wrong. And um, like I I just didn't want my my teacher to tell my parents. Right. right. Um, I was just terrified of my parents finding out and getting into trouble with them. But so were your parents making you lunch and you just weren't eating it? Oh, no, they they never really made me lunch. I like I, I always made my own lunch ever since really? I was like... Mm, six probably. is this okay yeah so is this part of your family background is that how that went or was um, it like a strict upbringing or it was just like my ho- parents worked a lot and they were really busy so like i just started taking care of yourself yeah pretty amazing. much yeah. Well, <laughs> that's amazing because my mom made my lunch until like i think the end of high school really? <laughs> yeah oh. she was a sweetheart though love you mom <laughs> um but anyway uh, i sort of in a bad it, it was good and it was also bad though too because i didn't really learn how to take care of myself mm-hmm. until university and in, mm-hmm. in that at that time there was enough anxiety that i was dealing with that mm-hmm. i was drinking and eating pizza yeah. and you were already taking care of yourself in public school mm-hmm. good for you but yeah. not totally i mean yes. you kind of do you recall where this whole thousand calorie thing came from at all like did it did you just decide did you hear it from somewhere were you watching tv it just seems like a really weird Mm -hmm. thing to develop for a kid yeah um, out of the out of thin air i honestly don't know um i just wanted to restrict myself and then a thousand just seemed like but were you reading anything or no no you just thought thousand calories that's it that's it Mm -hmm. like i didn't even look at like fat i didn't look at carbs i didn't look at protein just like calorie intake was like i was obsessed with it like Hmm. and do you think so do you think that in a sense was due to the mental illness or um i think it was just like this is um because i I have heard that eating disorders and i'm not saying this is an eating disorder Mm -hmm. this is something that you obviously had to to face at Mm -hmm. a young age but I have heard that a lot of eating disorders is actually a mental um, issue to mm-hmm. some extent. Um, I would 100% agree with agree with that. Yeah. Um, I I think looking back now that this is when um, like my depression really started, just okay. like my self image type of thing. Like I was just obsessed over my image and I wanted to change it. And yeah. Where do you, so you think that, so it was an image thing? Mm-hmm. Where do you think the image thing came from? Um. Honestly, I think a lot of it I sh- is due to my brother always, he, at this age, he would always um, emotionally abuse me. And so that was like, you know, calling me stupid, calling me fat, right. saying I have no friends and things like that. Uh, I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. And I mean, you seem like a very sensitive individual and your brother probably didn't know what he was doing at that time, right? He, I mean, this happened until like about three months ago when I cut him out of my life. Oh, really? Continued, yeah. Oh, wow. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, my dear. Yeah. I thought it was just kids being kids, oh, but no. clearly, no, this is a... My brother's an asshole. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. So he started picking on you at a, at a young age, and you think that um, actually might have contributed to the... Oh, 100%. Yeah. Really? Uh, yeah. So it turns out that family can can hurt you quite a bit. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm sorry that that happened to mm-hmm. you. 
And I'm so sorry that you had to go through all that, but mm. let's get back to the depression that you mentioned. Mm. Um, so also in grade um, seven, when I was 12. Um, you have a really good memory of, <laughs> as a kid, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. You can pinpoint these things. But do you think that's because it was so traumatic for oh, you? Oh, yeah, uh-huh. definitely. Um, so also in grade 12, um, it was also a self-esteem issue where I just... I hated myself. I hated looking at myself, and okay, and I began cutting myself. Ah, yeah. So, so you began cutting yourself in high school? No, this was Probably. at the age of twelve. At the age of twelve, mm-hmm. so before high school, mm-hmm. even. So, what made you decide that you you wanted to start uh, going down that road? Like, what what was the thought going through your mind when you decided that it was time to to start cutting? I just felt that you know physical pain was just. You know, it could be a distraction from emotional pain, right? Right. Mm. And that was my reason. Uh, and it, just, it became almost almost therapeutic for me, and I became addicted to it. Right. I just, I couldn't stop cutting. Really? Yeah. So would you say that the emotional pain was so bad that you wanted to transform it into something that just you could feel? Mm-hmm. And and you you became addicted to, to cutting yourself. Um, so... How long did that go for? It? And you don't still cut yourself, do you? No. Okay. No. So, so how? When did you realize that this was a, there was a problem and that you you needed to kind of change the way that you were doing things or handling things? Um, this was about not too long after I started, actually. Um, okay. Like I realized that I I just had to stop because I was actually the reason why I stopped was just like I was scared of people finding out like my parents I didn't want my teachers to find out I didn't want right. like, my friends to find out so I just I knew I had to stop right just for that reason and so when I stopped that emotional pain just kept it just it stayed within me I just bottled it up and dealt with it right yeah oh my goodness yeah well I appreciate you sharing your story with us so <laughs> far it sounds like it was a pretty rough childhood for <laughs> you and um when you were cutting yourself, I mean, did you try to hide? I, I don't know a lot about um, those that uh, that do cut themselves mm-hmm. or have cut themselves. We have had some on the show. Mm-hmm. Um, did you hear from someone that that might be a good thing to do? What made you think that that was something that would help? I <clears throat> I don't remember. You don't remember sort of the reason behind it? You just thought one day. Do you mind if I ask where you where you felt was a good spot to cut? Um, just along my wrist. Along your wrist. Both of the but you weren't ever trying to to end your life by doing no. that. Just okay, okay. No. Um, did you find that it was relief for a period of time by doing yeah. it? Yeah, 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 hundred percent. Yeah. And then you didn't want your family or teachers or anything to find out. So did you just stop automatically, or did you? Um, no, it it took a while because you know like I said I became addicted to it I tried to stop so many times and I just kept doing it and doing it um so I would wear like long sleeves I would wear like something on just something on my wrist to kind of cover it up Um, right yeah that was my way and and what was the final the final um sort of the end of the road where you stopped like how did the how did you stop um like I just, I was terrified of of my parents finding out. That was just like that was it. Like if my parents found out, they would like, they would go batshit crazy on me. Honestly, because like mental health with them is not a thing. Right. Right. If if they saw me cutting myself, they'd just be like, okay, you're absolutely insane. You're crazy, kind of type of thing. Not like, you know, you don't need help. You're just you're crazy, and that's it. That's, right. That's that. Right. And so it's a, and and that's. Very, very common. I mean, it's just now we're making this this huge leap where I know that when with my kids and with my daughter, I'll definitely understand if they come to me mm-hmm. and express the way that they feel. Mm-hmm. But even even with my family, I mean, they didn't know what to do with me. Mm-hmm. And uh, they they tried their best. But when someone doesn't really understand it, and I think a lot of the older generations didn't, mm-hmm. uh, and they're starting to if they have an open mind. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I, I, I think your parents probably did their best would you agree or do you um, think there's there was room for you know better than i do that's mm-hmm. me making an assumption to try to make things a little smoother here uh-huh. but you tell me um i honestly don't believe that my parents really tried with me okay. um they definitely could have done better um they could definitely try to understand because they're very strict they're very close-minded and it's like what i say goes type of thing right they're right. they're not there to open their minds to listen to me it's just right. like what they say 
goes and that is that it's a sort of a discipline mm-hmm. okay um so what age was this when you stopped cutting yourself um, i believe 13 13 so mm-hmm. like a full year you probably went dealing with your the pain you were feeling emotionally mm-hmm. trying to get rid of that somehow mm-hmm. and, and cutting your wrists was mm-hmm. your outlet mm-hmm. um and then you just stopped because you're because of fear mm-hmm. right mm-hmm and then and then what happened and then tell me the rest when you went to to high school how was how did you handle high school high school um i still had like all that emotional pain i just kind of bottled it up and and i realized i didn't actually i didn't realize that it was a problem i knew um like my self-esteem was an issue it's just i didn't understand the concept of mental health at the time right right i didn't know um that like looking back i know that i was depressed at this time right but at the time, I didn't know the signs of depression. I didn't know that what I had right. was a problem, right? So I just kind of... And who does at that age, really? Exactly, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. I, I, just, I really want younger people to just really understand the signs so that when they do see their signs in themselves, they reach out for help. Because I feel like if I had reached out for help at this time, I would have been just a lot happier today. Right, right. right. <laughs> And, um, yeah, throughout high school, I just, I bottled it up and I was, I was hurting just yeah. internally. Just, I dealt with it. And what, do you think that a lot of it had to do with, you're clearly, and this is not a bad thing. I mean, this is a compliment. You're mm-hmm. clearly a sensitive mm-hmm. young woman, right? Mm-hmm. And that's, that's a great thing when mm-hmm. it's not sort of internalized, mm-hmm. right? When you can put that out there mm-hmm. to help the world, that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. But when someone's saying uh, calling you a name or something mm. and you're sensitive you can walk around thinking about that all day mm. like was that kind of the way that you took things um, yeah like yeah. if anything kind of relatively bad happened like just a little thing i would overthink it like i would just think about it all day like for the next week and, right you know it just it it really affected me like with depression like just sad emotions just affect you that much more right Right. i think right so you've been dealing with depression would you say off and on or is it kind of Um, a continuing thing like you've you've dealt with sort of chronic depression or um definitely chronic um you know i i now have gotten a lot better but back then i feel like my days were either bad or worse Right. right and today like i've gotten a lot better i think my days are either you know, okay or good. Good, right? Good. Well, that's good news. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> good for you, and congratulations because that's an amazing place to get to. Tell me how you got there. <clears throat> how did you get um, to? How did you go from having a shitty day or a shittier day <laughs> to having an okay day or a good day? That's a huge transformation. So I actually wasn't diagnosed with depression until my third year of university. So that is eight whole years of me being, being depressed and not knowing it, right? Right. So it wasn't until I actually had to be told that I was depressed because I didn't realize it. Um, right. But when I was told that I was depressed, it kind of, everything just made sense, right? Sure. And um, so after that, my doctor put me on... Um, medication um antidepressants and yeah. then got me to do a cbt program so um cognitive behavioral therapy yeah um it was like a like a self-help type of thing just because i i couldn't afford like the like psychologists yeah. are expensive they are. right yep absolutely and so i just did a like self-help for i think seven months what did you um, use um the program was called bounce back and basically they just um you know, you have like a coach and they send you like these books on different aspects of your life. And yeah. then, um, yeah, you just kind of read them and try try to change your way of thinking, I guess. Like CBT is all about changing your way of thinking, like yep. understanding why do I feel this way yep. and getting to the root of the problem and then changing it. Just looking at it from a different perspective so that you're not always thinking of it in a negative light. Right. right? Yeah. And, we do... Um, Myself and a few other gentlemen, Paul Yoburn and Scott Millen, we do every Sunday, we do what's called Soul Fire Sundays. Mm -hmm. And right now we're going through, have you heard of Lucinda Bassett? No. Okay, so Lucinda Bassett uh, developed a 15-week program using cognitive behavioral therapy to attack anxiety, depression, and stress, basically, Mm -hmm. because these skills, and you'll probably agree with me since you've dealt with this at a young age, Mm -hmm. I think that this stuff should be taught in schools, in public schools. Like if we yes. had learned how to, to deal with our emotions and our feelings, uh, I think we would all be just stronger human beings mm. by now, right? Mm. Um, and so good for you for doing that course. That's fantastic. Mm. And I love CBT as well. Mm-hmm. I think it's great. 
and uh, we discuss it regularly. So, I mean, mm. I think last week we talked about, um, no, it wasn't assertive behavior. It was talking about getting off the guilt and worry treadmill. Mm. And so one of the lines that I love is that if you're feeling guilty, you're in the past. And mm. if you're worrying, you're in the future. Mm. And what's important is right here in this present mm. moment, that's where you find happiness. Mm. And that's sort of my what I took away from that week. But I mean, do you have sayings like that that you kind of think of when you're, give me an example of like, when you have a shitty thought in your head, what what do you do? What's what's one of the first go to sort of? And I call them cliche sayings because mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of the time they are mm-hmm. like this too shall pass. It mm-hmm. might be cliche, but it's true. Mm-hmm. So what do you think of? What are your go tos? Um, I guess I don't really have a saying per se. I just okay. I constantly remember that negative thinking is a constant cycle. You know, you think negatively, and then you know you something happens to you, you continue to think negatively and it, it's just right. a constant cycle, right? You have to break that cycle in order to be better, right? Right. And I just, I constantly have that just engraved into my mind. Right. So what do you do to break your cycle? Um, just kind of, just taking a step back, looking at a, at a situation in a different light, just thinking of different perspectives to look on it. If, if you know, you're out on the street, someone um like you wave to someone but they don't wave back yeah. maybe it's not that they don't like you maybe it's that they didn't see you maybe right. they're not wearing their glasses i don't right. know you just think of different ways to sure. look at it right sure don't take it personally mm-hmm. okay uh very very cool i mm-hmm. love that mm-hmm. and do you do any kind of relaxation techniques or meditation or anything um i don't currently but okay. um i recently learned that i have like generalized anxiety and my my doctor says like i have to um like he says I should do like meditation and stuff. I don't really mm-hmm. know how to meditate. I'll so. show you. I've got okay. cushions right behind you. You see what's right behind you there? I do. Yeah. So if you, what I practice is called mindful meditation. Mm-hmm. Um, there's different kinds, but uh, there's visualization, there's relaxation, there's multiple kinds of meditation, mm-hmm. if you will. But this is the kind that sort of you trace it back to and the lineage goes all the way back to Japan, to the samurai and to, um, individuals who really were considered Buddhas. Mm -hmm. They were enlightened. Mm -hmm. So I can teach you how to do it, but it just so you know, it's something that you need to do for like, this is a lifetime practice, Mm -hmm. but you will become a stronger Mm -hmm. uh, individual for doing it for sure. On a side note, I am Buddhist. I'm just a really bad Buddhist that doesn't know how to meditate. (laughs) Well, you know what? Good for you. Because Buddhism itself is uh, is a fantastic, it's not a religion, it's mm-hmm. a it's a fantastic spiritual practice. Mm-hmm. We'll call it that, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so is there anything in your story that if we go back, let's go and talk about some other sort of aha moments for you. I mean, we, we, we briefly discussed sitting down and talking, mm-hmm. and you've sort of told me about uh, your experience um, being a mute, would you say? Uh, yeah. Is that is that properly? Am I saying that like properly? It's, it's selective mutism. Selective yeah. mutism. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then we've talked about um, you dealing with emotions on a level where you ended up sort of trying to mm-hmm. express yourself um, by through physical pain by mm-hmm. cutting yourself. We've talked about growing up in sort of a stricter household where uh, your brother didn't have a lot of compassion for the way that you felt. Mm. Um, and that's unfortunate. It mm-hmm. really is. I'm sorry. I hate it because sometimes <laughs> the worst pain comes from family. Mm-hmm. And is there anything else that like we we want to make sure that you talk about your whole story here mm-hmm. because I know you didn't want to miss anything. <laughs> so you tell me where where we're going to next. Okay. So um, I'm gonna take it back to my first year. Um, I'm going back to um, the sure. social anxiety. Okay. Um, and so this is first year at Western first year at Western. Yeah. Okay. And so, um, I was do- diagnosed with, uh, like very severe social anxiety. Like I just, um, at, like this, I was, at this time in first year. Yeah. Okay. And, um, Who I diagnosed just, you? my, my family doctor, family doctor. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, um, I just didn't leave my room. I was in res and I actually just didn't leave my room unless it was to, you know, to go to class or to right. eat. And that was, that was it. I, I had friends in, in my first year. I had friends in res. I, I had friends. It's just like, I completely withdrew from everyone. And did people try to get you to come out? Um, yeah. Or did they know? Totally, yeah. And um, what, what did you say? Did you say, no, I can't, I'm I just, studying or I just was like, Oh yeah, I'm I'm busy type of thing, right? Um, yeah, yeah. I just kept making excuses. Just I didn't want 
to socialize. And, and social anxiety is also called social phobia. Right. People need to understand that, that there's an actual fear of being social. Right, right. yep. Um, what was it that scared you of being social? Um, Can you pinpoint it? I just... I remember having a fear of just being judged. Like I would walk through the calf and I'd feel all eyes on me, even if they weren't. Like right. I just feel like people were judging me. And yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, I, I tell my friends that and people like my friends are going to be like, um, they said things like, oh, they're probably staring at you because they think you're so pretty. And sure. like, <laughs> you know, sure. and I, but I didn't think of it that way. You know? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Judgment is hard. I mean, you obviously cared a lot. And this is a lot of people with anxiety, by the way. Mm -hmm. But you care a lot about what other people think. Mm -hmm. And it's not like you want to. Yeah, it's exactly. Just, yeah, it's mm -hmm. just something that you do. Mm -hmm. um, and as, as, as soon as you can sort of stop, that was a real freeing, empowering mm -hmm. moment for me. Mm -hmm was when I stopped giving a shit what anyone thought mm -hmm. and just start putting it on the internet, mm -hmm. <laughs> then I could realize, you know what? People, will either, they'll either fucking accept me or they mm -hmm. won't. And yeah. if they don't, that's fine. That's them and that's their life, mm -hmm. right? Like, and, and then I started sort of doing more reading and I realized that 20% uh, of the people that you meet mm -hmm. are going to like you. 20% mm -hmm. aren't, no matter what you do. And the 60% could really go either way. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they might get mad at you, but eventually mm -hmm. they'll come back around. Mm -hmm. So whatever you do and whatever you try to do, not everyone, you can't be liked by everyone. It's mm -hmm. basically impossible. Mm -hmm. And so just let know that and, and know that that's okay. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you can realize that, it's kind of a freeing, empowering, mm -hmm. to, empowering tool. Mm -hmm. And you attract a lot of people that don't give a shit either. <laughs> and that's cool because yeah. those are the best people to be around. At least mm -hmm. I find. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be around someone that's constantly worrying yeah. about what other people think. Mm -hmm. Then they're not themselves. Yeah. They're a different person with whoever they're around. Mm -hmm. That's not cool. That's not authentic. <laughs> Be you, right? Yeah. So that's an amazing realization. Mm -hmm. um, so first year was a struggle. It sounds mm -hmm. like you're just now, If correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like the your life is kind of just beginning in a way. Would you Not say, yet. Not yet. You still have some work to do? Um, yes. Um, so with the social anxiety. Yeah, tell um, me about it. Um, since I wasn't socializing, I kind of you know, withdrew from all my friends and I began to feel really lonely, right? It's yeah. just natural with it. Um, right. And so it got to a point where, where I actually attempted suicide. Ah, uh, my dear. I know. <sighs> was, was that in first year? It's my first year, yeah. In your first year. And that unfortunately happens to a lot of people that go into first year. I mean, any year, but first year seems to be a big one. Yeah, because it's, of... it's a lot of change, right? It's really stressful. And yeah. It's just, so stressful or stressful for me and i just i just couldn't handle it right and um obviously thank you for sticking with us mm -hmm. i've lost someone to suicide and it's it's really tragic it's a tragic thing that uh you never it, it affects so many lives mm -hmm. and the fact that you so many lives you probably don't even realize mm -hmm. so thank you for staying with us and thank you for fighting the fight i know it's not easy um <laughs> Tell me about what sort of led to that. What was the thought process behind that attempt? I just, I've never felt so lonely in my life because I was socially anxious, right? I, just, right. I kind of withdrew from all my friends and ultimately I just, I was very unhappy with my life. I was just very stressed um, and I just couldn't deal with my emotions at the time and I just wanted it to stop. I just wanted the pain to just stop. Right. So it was just, you were at this point in your life where living was tough mm. every day. Mm -hmm. um, was that in residence? I was in residence. Oh, yeah. geez. Uh -huh. So like, tell me about how you were treated after that, because that couldn't have been an easy experience, even, um, even coming back from something like that. Like, who was the one that kind of helped you get help and get you out of that situation that you kind of put yourself in. um or do you want to are you okay telling that story yeah yeah okay because yeah. um, you're um, helping people out here <laughs> right now that are, could be in the same spot mm -hmm. so honestly um i didn't tell anyone no one really found out um so did you call 911 yourself um the thing is um the way i did it was i kind of overdosed on pills right, right. i took six times the dose that i was allowed right, right. and um, what kind of pills if you don't um, mind these were 
um, these were benzodiazepines. Okay. So very, like, these are anti-anxiety drugs that are just very, very powerful. Like, imagine the, the smallest... The clorazepam and... I think so, yeah. Yeah, or actually, Ativan? Ativan. Yeah. Um, just imagine, like, the smallest pill that you could possibly imagine. That was the dose, right? Yeah. And I took six. Yeah. And it's dang- very dangerous if you took it with alcohol. Right. I took it with alcohol. Right. Um, and the moment that I did, I, you know, the thing is... um benzos they they yeah. fuck with your memory right yeah. so the moment that i did i don't recall anything after that hmm. i don't remember what happened um i just woke up i i don't remember what time of day that i woke up i don't remember anything about it really i just remember right. like waking up being confused looking over to my bedside there were pills and alcohol on it so i was like shit i just attempted suicide right, right. and um after that i i just i didn't want anyone to know and i just I kept it to myself and I just went on life. Right. Wow. So mm-hmm. you don't even really know. Like you could have just gone to sleep and it wasn't enough mm-hmm. to do the job. Mm-hmm. Thank God for that. Or thank the universe or whatever. <laughs> whoever, thank Buddha, whoever you believe in, right? Um, so, wow. I can't imagine what that was like for you. It was. It's, it's a scary thing not knowing what happened, like blacking out during this period of time and not just not knowing. That's that's a major fear for me like i don't know what happened and i woke up i, just, I was in my jeans on top of my bed like on, on top of the sheets yeah, right you didn't get ready and for bed or anything no like i i never wear jeans in my room ever right. um i'm usually never on top of the covers i'm under them always so right. it was just really confusing for me i didn't know what happened right mm-hmm. right is this the first time you've really told anyone about that? Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So none of your friends really know that you went through this. No. How do you feel? Um, I'm kind of happy that it's now out there, yeah, right? That I that must just, be I, a big thing yeah, to hold. Yeah, I bottled it up for so long, and now it's, just, it's yeah. out there, and I'm, I'm glad it's out there, actually. Well, you know, you have 100% support <laughs> from me and <laughs> anyone on the podcast, yeah. okay? So if you ever need someone to talk to about this <laughs> stuff... I can point you in direction of people um, that have also done, they've had multiple suicide attempts Mm -hmm. and they're living fantastic lives. Mm -hmm. So if you ever get in that dark spot again, Mm -hmm. you just reach out and Mm -hmm. we'll we'll make sure that we kind of get you out and and hopefully we can kind of coach you through it a little Mm -hmm. bit. Yeah. Um, So we're, no one's the therapist here. We're just real people (laughs) that, you know, trying to help each Mm other. But um, so, so first year was a rough year Mm -hmm. and you were clearly, I mean, you were given, you were prescribed benzos. Mm-hmm. So you'd, you'd obviously talked about, was this for the social anxiety? Mm-hmm. That so your doctor just thought, okay, she can handle this. If she gets a little anxious, pop one of these. Do you think that it's common for people to go to their medication given by their physician to try to end their life? Um, Is that a common way? I mean, because those are powerful pills. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I feel like it is common. Um, yeah. I guess we don't really know. We yeah. can't really comment on that. But I feel like the few people that I have talked to that have gone down that path, mm. it's been the same medication that's supposed really? to help them. And they just yeah. tried to take as much of it as possible. Yeah. So thank goodness it was only six. Yeah. It was just still a shitload for, especially someone yeah. this size, <laughs> right? But thank, thank goodness that uh, mm. you're still here with us. Yes. So tell me about the journey since that night. Um, I just... You know, it kind of bottled it up, and and um, you know, I never attempted since because it was that fear of blacking out again and waking up not knowing what happens. You know, right. and you know, it's, it's just the fear that, well, I guess not a fear, just the idea that death is not really certain. Like you could shoot yourself in the head, you might not die. You could right. jump off a cliff, you might not die. You might jump off a bridge, you might not die. And right. it's just like you can, with, <laughs> up, you can end up in a pretty rough spot. Exactly, and and. It's, it's that fear of, of death not being certain, something bad, something like... Even worse. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like actually, you know, living and, and being just broken still. You know? Right. In, in, in a physical way mm-hmm. or, or mentally completely, mm-hmm. right? Whatever. We don't even want to talk about yeah. that. But you're here right now. You're healthy. Yes. And the last couple of years, tell me, it sounds like first year was still one of those shitty days Mm -hmm. or shittier type of you know i go to day to day either being shit day or shittier day Mm -hmm. so how did you get to it sounds like this is within the last couple years then Mm -hmm. that Um, you're now in in the stage of okay or good mm -hmm. so um i kind of just opted to take out any stress 
by working out. Okay. Um, so I started lifting in my second year. Yeah. Um, and then towards the end, like starting my third year, I kind of lost interest in that because of my depression. You just you lose interest in things that even though you're like really interested, you just lose lose that right. interest, right? Yeah. And so I kind of just stopped. Um, mm, yeah, it's just like, I don't know. And then um, I began doing personal training because I wanted someone to like force me to work out because like... You were having a tough time doing it yeah, on your own. Yeah, exactly. And like, I know that exercising boosts your serotonin levels right. naturally, right? And I just, I really wanted that because I know I had an issue and that's how I went about it. And then, um, yeah, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy helped. Um, yeah. And yeah, that so did you take any other medication besides the benzodiazepines um i was on ciprolex and yeah then, i've been on that yeah and <laughs> then um pristique and, and medications uh it's a complicated thing because like you're on it for like a few weeks it's just side effects and then yeah. you're just like one month two months pass and then you're like oh shit it doesn't work for me and then you have to wean yourself off <laughs> yeah. and then it's like withdrawal and then you got to do that with a whole other drug you know and it's just yeah. like this constant thing of you know finding what works out for you and the weaning yourself off is the it's worst so shitty. The yeah. withdrawal yeah absolutely and i think that we, we've kind of gone through a, a podcast previously and talked about how people need to research what it's like coming off because eventually unless it works for you and that's the one you're taking for the rest of your life mm -hmm. there's going to be a time when you need to know how to get off that and yeah. sometimes that can be fucking tough oh, it's so almost difficult. all the time yeah excuse me so you've gone through university now and you are in which year i'm um, going into my fourth year now going into your fourth year mm -hmm. and how did you find dealing with school and the depression like did you ever get you know flunk out of any classes or you're a pretty good student how did you manage it all um i've never failed a course but wow. um, that's amazing <laughs> considering what you were going through um i know that i haven't like these past three years i haven't really put my 100 percent into it and i know that um and because of the depression, um, I do get accommodation for school and stuff. Like I get extra time for like tests and stuff. Um, right. Because my mind's so cloudy, you know. Right. And, um, so I have accommodation with um, services with students with disabilities at Western. Right. They're very accommodating. Um, good. Yeah. Well, that's a good thing to yeah. know. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm, yeah. Mental health is considered a disability for those who don't know. Right okay yeah and um yeah school's been tough though because like i just i don't want to do it i don't want to do the readings i don't really want to go to class but i, I just i force myself to because i know that i i cannot fail a course like right. coming from an asian family yeah. that's like yeah that you cannot do that right and that's another thing i wanted to just address while you're on <laughs> here um because i have you know a lot of friends that are of the same background that you are mm -hmm. or similar right mm -hmm. asian we'll just say asian yeah <laughs> Um, but the, the household seems to be consistent across the board where it's strict. And a lot of people say, oh, I could never go on your podcast because what if my parents see? <laughs> yeah. And this is, so I'm proud of you and I'm sure yeah. lots of your friends are right now mm -hmm. for, for explaining to us what it's like growing up in that uh, environment mm -hmm. and the things that you've gone through because the amount of people that you could be helping with your story, mm -hmm. and it's an incredible one, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, is fantastic. And okay. I think that's really important. I think that... Um, people are starting to kind of say, you know what, my story is more important than what people think of me, including my family. Mm -hmm. And if they can't take it, fuck them, mm -hmm. right? And I'm not saying we're saying that <laughs> by any means, but people kind of, they, 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 they've had enough and it's just, mm -hmm. it's at that point where, you know what, I need to be who I need to be in this world and I want to help those that are going through what I had to go through so mm -hmm. they're not alone. Mm -hmm. And so I'm proud of you and I think that everybody else on this podcast is proud of oh, you. Thank you. And thank you for sharing everything with us for the first time. Mm -hmm. So, um, tell us about good, I want to hear about the okay to good days. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that transition. Um, so after my CBT, um, you know, starting, which was seven months, you said, right? Seven months. Yeah. And, um, you know, I just started looking at things in a different way. Like it was kind of automatic for me. Right. And, you know, I, nowadays I just kind of deal with life, I guess. Like it's, it's 
satisfactory is not right. great and then i have my good days where like i'm proud of myself i actually can look in the mirror and be happy with myself you know right um good like, i still can't you know, I still find that I can't really look in the mirror and actually, you know, tell myself I'm beautiful, I'm worthy, and actually really, really mean it. Like, I tell myself that because I think that one day I will actually believe it, like genuinely right. actually believe it. So I, I tell myself that. So you use affirmations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you are beautiful. Thank you. And you are worthy. <laughs> You. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. And I don't just mean that from a you know a physical standpoint. Mm -hmm. I think you've got a beautiful soul. Thank you. <laughs> and I knew that before meeting you because Aww. yeah, you've been hooked up and you're willing to come on here. Mm -hmm. So um, keep telling yourself that because it is true. And don't let that. Uh, I'm the same way, and I think a lot of people are. It's mm -hmm. you don't want to be cocky, right? You want to <laughs> be like you don't want the ego to kind mm -hmm. of reach out and be like, oh, I'm <laughs> I'm the best looking guy in the world, or I'm the best looking lady around. So we kind of want to reel that in because mm. the ego is not a good thing. Mm. It's, it's really not. But having self-confidence is. Mm. You don't need ego to have self-confidence. You just need to love yourself. Mm -hmm. So as long as you love yourself, mm. I know you've got a lot of lovers out there. Well, maybe the wrong way to say it, but a lot of people <laughs> are loving this podcast and loving you for sharing your story. Mm. So you did the CBT, and is, mm -hmm. is it the CBT that did all this for you? Um, Pretty much because the... the um the medication, like I never found anything that really worked for me. And, and my doctor was like, oh, you now have mild depression. Um, this is like back in October, I had um, moderate. And now yeah. like I saw my doctor like a week ago and he says now I have mild. So How did they test you for that? How can they give um, you that? Tell me, tell me about that because I've never heard that. Really? There's um, like, um, like almost a checklist kind of thing, like symptoms. You kind of just check off and like you rate. Um, right. And you kind of total it up and then you, you get like a number. And if it's like in between these numbers, you're mild, these numbers, moderate, these, these numbers, it's severe. So right. I went down, I think, quite a bit from moderate. Right. To, yeah, mild. So. And you actually believe your answers. You weren't just like thinking of them as saying the better answer or anything like that? Um, to make you fit that category? Because, I mean, you know how you kind of like, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Because sometimes in that moment, mm -hmm. who's to say that that's not a good day and then the next yeah. day it would have been different, right? Yeah. The thing with that is also like it asks you within the past two weeks, okay. how have you, like this is your rating, okay. right? Um, and so, so it's not just on that day. No. And okay. so like even if like I felt like it asks you about suicide and stuff, if I, if I felt suicide like maybe four weeks ago, that, that wouldn't have picked it up, right? Yeah. And so like that's troublesome but like yeah i've got i i feel a lot better right it's not just like he told me like i'm better i just i genuinely feel better good yeah good do you think that when did you finish the cbt stuff by the um way? i think maybe may. may may so it's fairly fresh in your brain a lot mm -hmm. of it okay do you think that you're gonna have to continually practice a lot of that oh, stuff definitely like okay. it, it, they tell you like you have to read it over and over again to actually like get the effects of the cbt right you can't right. just read it once and like forget about it right no well you have to the way that it's been explained through the program that, that we're kind of doing is that negative thinking um and anxiety depression all that stuff the way that you think is a bad habit and it took you you're 20 years old right mm -hmm. so it took you and you started this started when you as far as you could remember four mm -hmm. so that's a total of 16 years where you've been training yourself to think negatively mm -hmm. So a lot of, you're gonna it's gonna take yeah. time and practice to untrain exactly. that right, and mm -hmm. then to reposition it so that it's positive stuff mm -hmm. and the healthy stuff that's going in. Mm -hmm. So that's the way that it was kind of explained to us with our CBD CBT program, mm -hmm. and uh, I totally get it. But the one thing that I will tell you is that um, this is only a 15 week program that that we're doing, and I've this is the third time I'm doing it now. Every time that mm -hmm. I do it. Um, I kind of remember some of the, some, I, the first time I did it was the most effective by far. Mm -hmm. I became like a whole new person, mm -hmm. but the world kicked the shit out of me again. No. So like I had to, if you don't practice it, yeah. you will go back and that's unfortunate. Like mm -hmm. it will, there are things you'll learn that will never go away, mm -hmm. but if you give up on practicing it, the world, unfortunately is still a pretty negative place to live. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of good in the world. Don't get me wrong. It's mm -hmm. still a beautiful world out there. Mm -hmm. But we're constantly hearing about this shit on the news and social media. Like, it's always negative. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is this awesome 
sort of uprising of like cute animals and positivity yeah. <laughs> and stuff like that coming on, uh-huh. which is great if you just focus on that. But unfortunately, there is shit that happens in the world too, and mm-hmm. that's that's part of life. Mm-hmm. And you said that um, you're having sort of you went from having shitty days to okay to good days. Mm-hmm. And the thing I think that's kind of realistic to remember here is that we weren't promised happiness every day of our lives. Mm -hmm. No one said that life was easy Mm -hmm. and no one said that life was fair. And so as long as we just kind of lower the expectations that we have, we, the world owes us something, Mm -hmm. you can live a great life regardless of where you are. Mm -hmm. And so I want that for you. Thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. (laughs) So, um, anything that I can do to help you in your journey while you're in London, where are you from, by the way? I'm from Mississauga. Mississauga, because mm-hmm. I saw when you called me, it was a Toronto. It was yeah. Six, what, what six was four seven. Six yeah. four seven, right? Mm-hmm. So you're just here for school? Yeah, and I'm um, here for the summer just because, um, honestly, because my brother's at home, I don't want to talk to him because like, I, I actually just cut him out of my life. Right? right. He's just, I can't even look at him. I don't talk to him. And that's just because he just won't let up on you. Yeah. Really? Yeah. He has always been like, at first growing up, it was physical abuse. And then um, I found that at the same time, my self-esteem issues kicked in. That was when he kicked into his emotional abuse, right? Right. That was constantly like, oh, you're stupid, this and that. And I began to actually believe that, right? Yeah. Do you think that he's got some mental health issues of his own? I think he's just a shitty person, honestly. <laughs> Do you want me to go kick his ass? Oh, yes, I'll drive, to <laughs> I'll drive to Mississauga and kick the shit out of your brother and teach him a lesson. How's that? Uh, Be good to your sister, man. <laughs> Are you his only sister? Yeah. Yeah, so is it just the two of you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, one boy, one girl. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all you guys have is each other. That's unfortunate. I know, really. and, and I see this happen with a lot of children where... You know, the parents say, oh, it's okay. They'll just, you know, they'll, they'll just grow out of it, right? And, right. They, and they they don't grow out of it because you're not telling them what they're doing is wrong. You're just right. letting them do it. And you're, you're, you're actually encouraging it by not saying anything, right? Right. So, yeah. Well, it sounds like you're becoming a very strong woman, you. young woman. And I think that, like... If you continue down this path mm-hmm. of CBT and uh, affirmations mm-hmm. and really developing yourself into your own woman and getting rid mm-hmm. of the values that were kind of impressed on you growing mm-hmm. up, I think you're going to have a really powerful conversation one day with your brother and with your parents mm-hmm. about when you're when you're ready. Mm-hmm. But I think you're gonna you're gonna have a lot to say, mm-hmm. and I think that you should make them listen. Yeah. But yeah, we'll see if they actually listen because well, no hopefully, Asian parents. <laughs> hopefully, I, yeah. I don't know Asian parents, but I hear about Asian parents, and that's why you're the first uh, female Asian on the podcast. Mm-hmm. So thank you for that. You've got yeah. uh, you set us a record for a record. Yeah, 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 a record for not just that, not just that. <laughs> but I'm saying like you've come on and you've you've literally opened up about three different things you never really talked about mm-hmm. before. Has anyone heard your story before or, or parts of it? Mm, well like growing up um like people have um you know people will say like oh remember when you didn't used to talk and stuff and it's just like oh shut up um, right and they'll just keep bringing it up and and this was like during high school like get over it i'm over it why don't you get over it yeah. right and it's just like stop bringing it up and you know people have like i've grown up with people who like have seen me d- deal with it but mm-hmm. like i never really you know the people that saw me when I was selectively mute didn't grow up with me like till today right Right. they they saw that part of me you know I had people see you know my self-esteem issues kind of and then people who now have have, I've told about like my depression my anxiety and stuff like that so no one has really known my entire story in its entirety right? right they know bits and pieces and that's it right well you know what um, it's fantastic that you've shared everything that you have tonight you. and we love you for it. Thank you. And, uh, is there, tell me about sort of what you've learned and what messages you'd have for other people that are potentially going through this or will go through this. Mm-hmm. Like what, what have you learned through everything you've been through so far? And I know this is just the beginning of a whole new life mm-hmm. for you. Um, any sort of advice? Um, I know people are tired of hearing this, but it does get better. Like mm-hmm. I've dealt with the past 16 years of dealing with this, these mental health issues 
over mental health issues over mental health issues right. and in the end i am now better and i know what it's like to constantly feel like you're fighting and fighting a battle within your own mind and feel so powerless to it i know right. what that feels like to feel like you're fighting for nothing i know what that's like but you know in the end it'll all be worth it because uh -huh. you are stronger than you think yes and um honestly to anyone listening you need to remember that you are loved and you are cared about and you are a blessing to this world oh sweetheart <laughs> that was so good let me unravel you some toilet <laughs> paper, paper. <laughs> i know it's embarrassing <laughs> you to do it so i'll do it for you we ran out of tissue, so we went to the <laughs> alternative this evening. But um, is there anything else that you want to say, Monica? Anything else you want to share? Um, I think that's the end of my story. Your yeah. story was phenomenal. Uh, and I you. And I really didn't know it was going in so many different directions. <laughs> yeah. But it, like I said, I mean, you're 20 years old. Mm -hmm. I didn't really start dealing with mine until eight, nine years after you. And even oh. then it started, it's still, I was still on medication. Mm -hmm. I was still... Um, struggling mm -hmm. up until probably two years ago when I made some real changes mm -hmm. and so you're ahead of the game mm -hmm. in my eyes and you're gonna have a really bright future I hope so I think so <laughs> I, I know so I know so <laughs> So keep doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, if you ever need anyone to talk to, I mean, it sounds like you've got a great support system with Marlon. Oh, 100%. And with your, yeah, and with Spur and mm -hmm. with all your Western friends. And I know mm -hmm. some of them, and they're all everyone that's come on here yeah. has been fantastic. Mm -hmm. So uh, feel free and bring back anyone that wants to share their story mm -hmm. by all means. Okay. Okay? Okay, thank you. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, that is it for this evening with Monica Chun. Yes. I said that right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and uh, give her some support because this is her first time sharing her story mm -hmm. um and we hope it helped other people out there because um you know i know that it was really great talking to you and mm -hmm. relating to you on the mental health stuff mm -hmm. it's no joke so um you know take care of each other out there and we have another woman crush wednesday podcast coming up with another incredible story with miss lauren benson and that will be happening in one hour so stay tuned for that and thanks for watching guys catch you next time bye for now <laughs>